A stat students. Okay, let's talk about bias. Best way to talk about bias is, let me tell you a couple of stories. Story number one. Uh, it's 1936, and uh, there's a presidential election going on between Franklin Roosevelt and Alfred Landon. And there was this magazine back then called the Literary Digest. And the Literary Digest was really good at predicting elections. And what they would do is they would send out a whole bunch of, uh, of surveys, and then they would get those surveys back, they would look at the results, and they would predict, based on the results of the survey, who was going to win the election. So they sent out 10 million surveys. Think about it, 10 million. It's a really expensive, really difficult thing to do, but they did it. And, uh, well, what happened? Uh, well, first off, you've got to talk about who, how they did this thing, okay? So they got addresses from uh, various sources, including their own subscribers, car registration records, and telephone records, okay? And, uh, and they got 2,400,000 replies. So millions, literally millions of replies. And so one would think, oh, this is a really, a really robust survey. They did a good job. Well, let's see uh, if they did do a good job. Uh, they had, like I said, they had a good record. For the prior five elections, they had, uh, not only had they accurately predicted who was going to win, they even did a really good job of predicting the margin of victory. So, you know, one would expect that they're going to do pretty well. Um, this time, they said, Landon is going to win. He's going to win by a landslide. It's going to be at 370 electoral votes to 161. Guess what didn't happen? That's right. This, uh, this didn't happen at all. Instead, what happened was Roosevelt won. Roosevelt won by a landslide, 62% uh, of the popular vote, and by a margin of 523 to 8 electoral votes. So what I want to know is, what happened, okay? Why did, it get, why did it go so crazy wrong? I'll tell you why. Bias, okay? Bias is your enemy when it comes to surveying, when it comes to collecting data. You want to get as unbiased data as possible. So, let's look more specifically what went wrong. Like I said, they used various lists of people and their addresses, including their own subscribers, car registration records, telephone records. This is 1936. What's going on in 1936? The Depression. People are poor. Most people don't have magazine subscriptions, cars telephones. Only the rich people did. So basically, the Literary Digest surveyed wealthy people. And so they got a good prediction of how the wealthy people were going to vote, but they didn't get a good prediction of how everybody was going to vote. So this leads us to uh, a couple of different, uh, uh, um, well, let's just talk about a, co a couple of different problems uh, that were in their survey. Number one, under coverage. What is undercoverage? Undercoverage is when the sampling frame does not resemble the population. What's a sampling frame? The sampling frame is the portion of the population that has a chance of being sampled. So in this particular case, the sampling frame would be the people who received the, uh, uh, the surveys. Okay, Those people that they got the addresses of. Because if you didn't receive a survey, there was no way that you were going to respond to the survey. So if you weren't in that sampling frame, of people who have cars or magazine subscriptions, sorry, or phones or something like that, then you were not in the sampling frame. So under coverage is when your sampling frame does not represent your population well at all. And in this case, that was definitely the case because their sampling frame was wealthy people and the population was people, uh, this population that was going through a depression right now. Um, <clears throat> another problem they had was non-response bias. They got 2,400,000 uh, uh, responses, but they sent out over four times that many. So when a large proportion of those surveyed refuse to answer, that's when you have non-response bias. The problem with non-response bias is that those who do choose to respond might not be like all those people who didn't choose to respond. Okay? It could, people, it could be that some people got this survey and they thought, yeah, I'm going to vote, but I, don't really, I really don't feel like sending this back. Uh, I'm poor. I can't really afford the envelope and the stamp right now. Uh, so it could be that the people who responded really didn't look like the rest of the people at all. 
And if that's the case, then you have non-response bias, and this particular survey suffered from both of these. Uh, let's talk about uh, um, another story. Ann Landers. Ann Landers was somebody who used to write for magazines, and she had an advice column. This is back, back in my day when I was a kid. She had this advice column, and she would uh, uh, people would write in with their problems, and so she would uh, uh, respond uh, and give advice. And so somebody wrote to her back in 1976 and said, oh, you know, we're, we're wondering whether we should have a child or not, but we really don't know. Uh, we, we look at all these people that are friends of ours, and so many of our friends seem to resent their children. They envy us our freedom and go the way that we come and go as we please, and then they go on to talk about money, how, well, you know, right now we have money and our friends who, uh, who have kids, they don't have any money at all, and they paint this bleak, bleak picture in this, in this letter. And then at the end, it says, will you please ask your readers the question, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? Well, Ann Landers published the, the letter, and 10,000 people responded to the letter, and of those 10,000 people, 70% of them said, no. Oh, man. 70% of the people said, no, we would not have children again. I truly hope that my parents were not in that, uh, uh, in that group there. So, uh, so that's, that's really something. So Good Housekeeping, that's the, the magazine that the, the letter was uh, published in. Good Housekeeping responded by publishing the letter and then saying, all of us at Good Housekeeping know that no mother will be able to read Ann Lander's report without passionately agreeing or disagreeing. If you had to do it over again, would you have children? Well, this time, 95% of, of the responses were yes. So what gives? Is this just proof that surveys don't work? Uh, how is it that Ann Landers got the vast majority of people saying no, they wouldn't, and then Good Housekeeping got the vast majority of people saying they would? What's going on? Bias again, okay? Under coverage again. Both Ann Landers and Good Housekeeping were asking their particular readers to respond. Because, by the way, Ann Landers did, didn't just uh, publish in Good Housekeeping. She published all over the place in all these different uh, uh, um, newspapers and magazines. So only the people who read that column would respond. Uh, she all, it also suffered from voluntary response bias. Now, voluntary response bias is kind of like non-response bias in that it's only those who feel strongly are really going to respond. The, the difference, the, the primary difference between voluntary response bias and non-response bias is that with voluntary response bias, you're just opening it up to anybody who reads this. It's actually very, very difficult to tell what the sampling frame is in voluntary response bias because you don't know who happens to be reading. Uh, with the, uh, with the, the, the literary digest, they sent that survey to a bunch of people. They knew who the sampling frame was. It was a bad sampling frame, but they knew what it was. In this particular case, they didn't even know what the sampling frame was. So you got that kind of bias going on. But again, only people who feel strongly about this, only people who read this and go, oh yes, I have, I have strong feelings, in particular, negative feelings, are gonna respond. And then there was response bias. Response bias is when the administering of the survey itself influences the response, okay? Now in this case, Ann Lander's readers were influenced by the very negative letter that was in that column. You know, you're reading that letter and you're seeing all these, uh, uh, all these arguments to not have a child and you go, yeah, you're right, I'm not gonna, I wish I hadn't done it. Now Good Housekeeping, on the other hand, their readers were reacting to the results in that survey and they were saying, no, 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 how can you possibly do this? No, and so they're, they have this negative reaction to, uh, uh, to those results. And then also, Good Housekeeping, if you remember how they phrased the question, they said, no mother will be able to read. So they were specifically asking the mothers to respond. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, you're gonna get a lot of people responding saying, no, 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 of course I would have my children again. How could you be so cruel to, to suggest otherwise? Um, so, by the way, later on, after, after that, that went on, two other surveys were conducted, uh, and these surveys used random selection, which we're going to talk about in the next video, 
and uh, they asked the exact same question. Uh, the Kansas City Star uh, surveyed 409 people. 94% said, yes, we would have kids again. And uh, Newsday magazine surveyed uh, 1,373 people, and 91% said yes. So apparently good housekeeping, although they, their, their number was inflated a little bit. Their survey was a lot better than Ann Lander's original one. Okay, so just to, to, to summarize, bias. It's a systematic mismeasurement of some kind of population, okay? It's uh, uh, the, the common types of bias that we saw were under coverage, non-response bias, voluntary response bias, and response bias. These aren't the only kind, but they're four very common kinds. And uh, bias always exists when one characteristic of the population is either overrepresented or underrepresented. It's when the sampling method that you use systematically overstates or understates the true value of the property it's trying to measure. So in, in other words, you get a statistic that's not like the, the uh, uh, parameter. And, uh, and it means you're going to get a sample that doesn't represent the population, and you're going to get a statistic that really doesn't represent the parameter. So bias is definitely something you want to avoid as much as possible. All right, next video we have, we're going to talk about randomness. Randomness ends up being a very good tool to avoid bias and good sampling techniques. I will see you then.